thanks for the presentation. And thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, it's my second time with Creative Technology Week. I was here a couple of years ago. I uh, had a lot of fun, so I'm very happy to be here again. I was already introduced. Well, my name is Tom. Uh, as Isabel said, I, I work in Hong Kong for SEM, the School of Creative Media. And I work mostly on, on art, um, especially or specifically in new media art. And I think of new media art as the art that is only possible when artists appropriate the knowledge behind a certain technology or the knowledge behind a certain scientific fact. And more importantly, when artists appropriate the processes of creation of new knowledge, which changes the relationship that we have in technology and allow us as artists and as people who experience our art to develop different narratives of what technology is or what the social or political impact of those technologies may be. And this is what I want to talk about, uh, mainly want to talk about today is how we can help as artists to create alternative narratives, alternative understandings, alternative rhetorics of what uh, the political impact of technology can be. This is a piece, I, I've been working on this for almost 20 years, or for actually more than 20 years. And this is a piece of, I think, 10, 15 years ago, where we created a little, more, as a big uh, interactive installation that would react to people who were close to it. But we also created an in internet interface so people could interact with it using their mobile phones or uh, web page. And the, the piece then uh, turned into an abstract, a low resolution communication device from the people who were in the gallery space and the people who ac ac were accessing it remotely. And I, I'm showing this because this piece was before Arduino was popular, before all the APIs and, and frameworks that we have now were in use. And the only reason that we were able to create this piece is because we did go through this process of appropriation of the knowledge behind the technology. And we did exactly the opposite that. Uh, the previous speaker said like we did not hide the technology, we did not hide the, the components, but we actually tried to create a narrative where people could understand the components and what role they were playing and appropriate the experience from that point of view. This is a piece uh, from last year, which is, um, I, I was interested, or I am interested in alternative forms of interaction. So I created this uh, flexible screen that is pulled from, uh, from strings with or with strings attached to motors and therefore it changes shape. And then I, I, I collected a, a close-up videos of people with of bodies with scars. So the piece is somehow poetically trying to recreate the violence behind uh, that led to that scar. So uh, the title is, uh, the piece is titled Ecrasis, which is um, Latin for remediation. So the idea was to, again, uh, offer alternative ways of experiencing uh, technology or art in this case. And I'm particularly interested in the political aspects or what I call arts and society. This is a piece that I presented uh, two years ago here, which is an embodied data visualization. So I took uh, all the recordings of people who died trying to get to Europe crossing the Mediterranean and created an embodied uh, visualization. Um, so uh, it's a piano performance of, of Beethoven's Sonata Pathetic that is distorted with electricity representing the deaths of people trying to get to Europe. So it's a, a classical piece of European, there we see. A classical piece of European culture that is distorted with the representation of people trying to get to Europe. And I think this is particularly important when you talk about art and AI, because art, uh, AI or machine learning is, is gonna change everything because it challenged what our understanding of what could be done with computer was. We thought we needed to understand the problem in order to be able to create a formal method, a formal model, and then use that model to create some computational device that works with this model trying to solve the problem. With machine learning, we have, we train these, these models with data, and therefore we don't need to have this understanding of what the problem is. We train a model with, with uh, vast quantities of data, and then the machine learning algorithms find complex relationships in the data, recognizing patterns that humans may or may, may not may or may not be able to identify. And then we would, would not know how to use them in rule-based explicit programming. And this is both the strength and the danger of machine learning because on one hand, uh, we can solve a lot of new things. On the other hand, the training data uh, incorporates biases present on the data, present on the, so the, the social context where this data comes from. 
And on, on, on top of that, these systems are very hard to debug. They are kind of like a black box, and we don't really know how they work. So, and this is, uh, this now it's too loud. And this has been used, uh, for example, uh, in, 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 in the press with the, create, with the dangers of AI backed uh, fake news, because now everybody can create, this is a work that is not, it's not from me, but everybody can create believable things. And this is also something that is very interesting because uh, fake news have been around for a long time. Uh, we know uh, this uh, classic uh, photo of uh, Nikolai Ivanovich Yeshov, that it's, well, it was the right hand of Stalin, and then he was erased from the photo. Or we know uh, this iconic portrait of US President R.M. Lincoln, which is actually a composite of Lincoln's head and the southern politician John Calhoun's body. Or we know this very famous uh, photo of General Ulysses Grant in front of his troops in 1864, which actually is a composite of three different photos. And therefore, uh, I would like to ask us, OK, these machine learning fake news are so groundbreaking because they're believable, or because now anybody with a powerful enough computer can create that. Where, where, where is the groundbreaking come from? Comes from a shift of access or comes from a shift of repercussions or a, or a shift of the ways we uh, can distribute that. So I've been trying to explore this political area of AI. Uh, this is a piece, it's a collaboration with UC Davis professor Katia Vega. And we created an ethnicity predictor uh, machine learning system. And then, because my artworks tend not to be very subtle, uh, we created a racist door. And it's a door that is locked unless you're white. So there's a little camera there. And uh, the, the door tries to analyze in real time your ethnicity and reacts accordingly. And of course, the idea is to uh, show uh, what the, the things that we can do with machine learning now, but also allow people or help people or work with people into creating alternative narratives and alternative understandings of the political impact. This idea of racist machines, uh, we kept exploring it, so we created this racist uh, gamble uh, machine that is, if you're white, you get free candy, and only if you're white. And we added this little screen there to, to help uh, people understand what was going on. Um, we shot it in Tempe, Arizona a couple of months ago, and it, was, it, it caused uh, quite an impact. And it was very interesting how people were trying to, because the system does not work uh, perfectly, also because race and ethnicity are social constructions, so you, don't, you can't have a, an objective measure of that. But it was very interesting that when it misworked, people would think that, oh, the system is seeing some inner truth, something that I might not be aware of, but I am kind of black or kind of Latino or whatever. And we always give that power to these machines. And as I was saying, uh, these machine learning algorithms tend to be black box. So not being subtle, I created a series of black boxes. Um, this is a, a, an artwork that I showed in Tokyo last year which I titled Memoirs of the Bland, and it's, uh, it's a machine that, it's a black box with a person's face with their eyes closed, and it doesn't do anything, but if you blink, it takes a photo in the moment that you're blinking and, change, and puts your face with your eyes closed there. So it's a collection of people being seen by the artwork in the moments that they're not seeing the artwork. So trying to change the uh, subject-object relationship that we have with these technologies. And so I didn't collect the faces, but I could have created a, 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 a data set of people blinking. I have this also with this idea of black boxes. I have this little artwork that I'm showing uh, out here, so you can uh, go and experience it, that I titled Smile. And it's uh, a drone footage of the Gaza Strip, the most destroyed area, that uh, you can only see it if you smile at it. And if you stop smiling, it fades out. The video stops and it fades out. So again, it subverts the relationship that we have with, this, with these machines, but also forces you or prompts you to reflect on what are your thoughts about the footage that you're seeing. You stop being just a passive recip re recipient of that footage, but you are prompt to create, to develop that narrative. And I'm going to finish with, because these facial tracking recognition uh, technologies that I've been using, uh, remind me of uh, Stephen Gould's uh, The Mismeasure of Man. We are in, I've also been working with uh, genetic engineering with my time at Broad Institute, and it, it looks like we're on the verge of a new eugenics, so it, it, I would like to 
prompt people to reflect about this, to think about this. Uh, Stephen Wood identifies two fallacies, the reification, which is our ten tendency to convert abstract concepts into entities, like confusing the map from the territory, and ranking, which is this idea of that we uh, as give order to things that do not have an, an, an internal order or an inherent order. And I've seen papers, and I've been read, reading papers that propose machine learning systems that would uh, identify your personal political beliefs, whether you have a high, a high IQ or not, whether you're predisposed to crime, and so on. And these things are touted, these things are given to uh, society without many times the necessary reflection and necessary discussion of those things. So that's what I'm trying to help build. So thank you very much. Uh, this is, these are my contacts.